time in our sermon series in Judges. We began this new sermon series a few weeks back, but every week in the, the book of Judges, we find ourselves uh, uh, seeing just apostasy, re, uh, God's people repent, uh, war break out. This week, we get to uh, look at a Hebrew a worship song, like a corporate worship song. That's what we're going to do. It's a, it's a unique thing. It's a, it's kind of, it hits you kind of by surprise as you're studying Judges because you see just, just this these different judges being raised up to lead God's people in repentance, and then, uh, you know, after that, they fall away, and things get worse, and it just gets it gets messy, but what we get to see today is the, the result of God's great victory. Last week, we saw Deborah, God used to, uh, to speak to Barak, the military leader, to push him towards obedience to God. He stepped out in faith, and God gave them a great victory over those who were oppressing them for uh, two decades, 20 years, and we saw that God is the victor, and so today we are we're getting to read. We're going to read and see the celebration. They wrote a song about it, and this isn't your normal song. This isn't the song you hear on Christian radio, not at all. It's it's a it's an epic song, and so if you'll look with me at Judges chapter five, uh, verse one. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hands. One of our ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, this is our gift to you. Um, but here we go. We're going to go verse by verse through this. But I want you to see the surprise, see the beginning of it. It says this, uh, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day. Verse 3, Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord. I will sing, I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. What we are going to read and examine today is known as a heroic poem or a, a war ballad or a, a, a victory hymn. God's people writing music to to tell the story of the great things God has done. That's how Christian music should be. It should be God's people writing great uh, uh, lyrical poems, songs, uh, accompanied by great sounds to uh, tell of the good things, the great things that God has done. And so this is a a hymn to be, be sung corporately. See, it's Deborah and Barak. They're singing together. And they're even, they're telling, look, they're telling the kings, hear, O kings, hear, O princes, uh, to the Lord, I will sing. They're not saying, you, you, they're saying this is what God has done. It's really awesome. It's a corporate song. And what I did was um, in our study guide that, that we wrote, we, we put together in, in for this chapter a little bit about corporate worship, how we do corporate worship here at the well. But today, rather than speaking to that, I'm going to just go verse by verse through this song and we're going to examine its content. And so that's what I want us to see first is that this song kind of surprises us out of the text of Judges, celebrating what God has done. And look, he, he says, they, or she says, Deborah, the, the songwriter says, Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. But she's speaking to the, the nations that exist around her. This isn't like God's people don't have a king yet. They don't. She's saying, hey, the nations need to hear of what God has done. The nations need to hear of what God has done. And this is what we see first. That's how it starts. Look, look, look what God has done. Verse one through five. Then they then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day that the leaders took the lead in Israel and the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. To the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. The Lord went when you went, or Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. See, this corporate worship song, our singing is to celebrate what God has done. That's what they're doing. They're singing and celebrating what God has done, specifically in giving this military victory through the leadership of Barak, through the the, the prophetic wisdom and and, uh, leadership of Deborah. We saw that last week. God has delivered his people from 20 years of, of oppression. And now they're writing a song. They're telling, and notice that they're talking about the importance of, of, of God. Look what God has done. They're not celebrating primarily those who were involved, though we'll see how, how, the, how the songwriter uh, speaks to how awesome uh, the, you know, the, the people were who were involved, meaning God blessed them. But it's important for God's people to constantly be reminded of what God has done. 
And this is what songs help us do, right? When you sing, you hear a song, a song helps you be reminded of something, correct? If you listen to a song in the 90s, those of you who were listening to music in the 90s, you'll be like taken back to a point in time. You're going, oh man, I remember when I heard that song first. I remember when, where I was. I remember uh, the friend group I was around. I remember the clothes I wore. I, I remember it all. Like you remember. See, songs help us be reminded of seasons and times and places. Christian songs, corporate songs should help us be reminded of what God has done. Where were you when, 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 when God gave this great military victory? That's what the song is saying. Look, we remember what God has done. We remember what the clouds looked like. We remember what God has done. So the first thing we see here is that, that, that as we look at what God has done, these leaders, the leaders who led the way, Barak and Deborah, they are commended here. They're, they're commended for their leadership. And if you remember last week, Barak, he was very timid. 20 years didn't step out and go lead his people to war. When God had told him, 20 years of disobedience, just think about that. 20 years of timidity, disobedience, delaying obedience, and finally, through faith, he steps out because of the pushing and prompting and the leadership of of Deborah to to get him out on the battlefield. And and, and he has this great victory. God provides the victory. But I want you to see this. Brock's praise, he's commended here. I want you to think about this. 20 years of timidity is not what he's being remembered for. He's being remembered for this moment of faith. See, the issue is not the size of your faith. The issue is the size of the, your God in whom you have faith in. See, it took one moment of obedience for Barak to step out in faith, and God gave them the victory he had already promised. So for those who are struggling with their faith, be encouraged be encouraged. Don't delay obedience like Brock did, but if you have delayed obedience, maybe today you step forward in, in faith, seeing that faith is what's being praised here, the faith of Brock to step out. And when you see someone struggling, say in our church or in your life, your friend group, you see them struggling in their faith, encourage them like this song does, uh, especially when you see them act, that they've been struggling for so long, they step out in faith. Don't talk about, well, hey, bro, 20 years, you should have been obedient. You, you wasted 20 years. Praise them for the one moment of obedience in that day and in that time. You can't get, your, you can't get the past back. You can't get the past back. You can chart a new trajectory forward. And what I love about this song is it's, it, it is praising Barak for his, his, his faith. We even see that in Hebrews, uh, he's, he's in the hall of faith. But if you look at 20 years of his life, you, if you just examine the 20 years of his life, you will he'll look like coward, faithless, phony, weak leader. And that's exactly who he was. Until he, through repentance, meaning he turned from disobedience and marched forward in faith. And he's remembered for his faithfulness. He's praised for his faithfulness. So if you see someone in, 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 in your life, in our church, who's been struggling, and they take one step of faith, one step forward, man, encourage them like the song does. Praise them for it. Don't, don't spend your time talking about the 20 years of the past that you can't fix. Talk about the faith in the present that's going to propel them forward. Encourage them to continue. And then you see people like Deborah. Man, she was faithful the whole time. Deborah was faithful the entire time. She's also praised here. So what we see is this song praises the faithfulness of one who, who, had, who lacked faith for many years and then stepped forward in faith. And then it praises those who stepped forward who have been faithful for many years. It praises both of them. That should be an encouragement. So you see those in, in your life who've been faithful throughout hard seasons, hard times, hard days, continually being faithful generation after generation, encourage them also. God sees their faithfulness. They don't need a, a season of rebellion. They don't need a season of disobedience. Praise them for the season of faithfulness that, that you've seen, you've witnessed. The second thing we see off the bat is that God raised up volunteers. So, so God is being praised and he's using le- the leadership of others, but he's also raising up for himself volunteers. It says that they, they offered, the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Volunteers. This is a volunteer army. This is a volunteer group of people. The song teaches us that, that God is using, literally some of your translations will say they volunteered. I think this is awesome. I think this is awesome. Whether it be war and judges, God raising up volunteers, or Sunday service, God raising up volunteers. Each Sunday, many of you, you're, you're, you volunteer your time, your talent, your treasure to serve Jesus, his purpose, his mission. And what it says here is that volunteers are praised. 
They're to be praised. You gave yourself willingly. Thank you, church. I want to thank anyone in here who loves, serves this church voluntarily. Thank you for your generosity. You should be praised in the same way they're being praised. We praise God for the volunteer, the volunteers of our church. Next, we see God is there is praised. It describes him as a, as a warrior marching out the battle. Like it, this is literally God marched. He says, when you, he's speaking to God, marched. From the, uh, the God is the one marching. He, and it, the sounds that it, it, it describes when God marches is like thunder. The ground sh- earthquakes. God, it's, it's, the, it's personifying God going to battle for his people. God went out. God marched out. See, I need us to understand no matter what you're going through, it is the Lord who fights your battles. It's the Lord. And this song reminds us of this. Therefore, as we we read the song, we sing songs, we need to be reminded that God goes before us. He's the one who fights for us. He is for us. He's not against us. Next, what we see in the song in verse 6 is that we we need to take notice of what God is doing. And what is he doing? He's transforming us. Culture. This is what the the song testifies to. It says this: In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers uh, were kept by uh, kept to the byway, which which is he's, he's indicating that the culture was unsafe. Um, the 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 villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased. Uh, until or they had ceased until I arose. I Deborah rose as a mother in Israel. When the new gods were chosen, then the war was at the gate. So when God's people were, were, were idolaters, chasing after other gods, false gods, the gods of the culture, war broke out. And she says uh, she was a shield or a spear to be seen among uh, or 40,000 in Israel. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offer themselves willingly. Again, we see those volunteers among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit in, on rich, in rich carpets, you who walk by the way to the sound of the magicians, uh, oh, sorry, musicians at the watering places, there they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Then down to the gates march the people of the Lord. It's a song. I know we're not singing it right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking it. What this song is telling us here lyrically is that in, the, in, in verse 6, in the days of Shamgar, uh, son of Anath, and Jael, the, 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 the culture was a mess. The culture was corrupt. In verse 6 through 8, we see the, the, the telling of the perverted culture, the, the, the corruption, the dangerous borders, the, uh, the, the idolatry that was going on throughout Israel, God's people, their land. And we, we see how, how corrupt and how miserable society and culture was when God's people forsook his word, will, and ways. And this is what we keep talking about. When God's people turn from him and when a culture, when a nation forsakes the God of the Bible and chooses to worship or choose, chooses to worship uh, other false gods and do what they, quote, feel right in their own eyes, as we see is the refrain in Judges, misery, destruction, and ruin ruin comes on a people. And this this song is testifying to this. The misery and ruin are happening in the rebellious season, and the song is testifying to this. But then it it changes its tone. When when Deborah rose, when God raised up a faithful leader, a, a, a judge, and she engages, as we saw last week, in the civic sphere. She engages, engages in the culture. She's led. She's filled by God, the Holy Spirit. She uses godly wisdom. She, she exercises her gifts according to his word, his will, his ways, as we saw last week. Last week, and now what is she saying? She's testifying what happens when God's people do this transformation in the culture. There's a change after verse 8, and we move into verse 9. It's worth celebrating. Like, bless the Lord. God raised up a leader, and now we're, we're charting a new trajectory. Verse 10, it says that, that to tell of it to those who ride on white donkeys, what is, and those who are rich, what he's saying, what, what she's saying is. Everyone should be talking about this. The city's being transformed in such a way that everyone's talking about it. The rich are talking about it. The, uh, the, the prosperous are talking about it. The, mu- the, the, the musicians are writing songs about it. They're pretty pumped about it. Those in rural areas, those who quote unquote walk by the way, these are just average Joes, regular, normal, everyday people, everyday life. 
They're celebrating. What we see is that they're, they're all, all of the, the, the nation, the, the, the culture around them, the, the, the city, the, the, the rich, the poor, the, the blue collar, the white collar, they are, they are celebrating what God has done in this cultural transformation here. They're celebrating freedom. They're, exp- they're celebrating change. See, it went from dangerous, unsafe times. Corrupt, unrighteous, perverted, weird Now it's pure. There was idolatry all over the place. God's people were not worshiped the one true and living God. Now they are. They've changed. They've repented. The culture has changed, and now they're worshiping the one true and living God. This is what's happened. Dangerous to safe when God's God's ways are, 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 are being accomplished. It goes from corrupt to righteous, perverted to pure. Idolatrous worship to worship of the one true and living God. See, I want us to see this. This cultural transformation happens when God used a timid man, a timid man, Barak, and the faithfulness of this woman, Deborah, in the civil sphere. And what we saw is citywide cultural transformation. This is what we aim to do here in San Antonio. We aim to see citywide transformation. We aim to see our city transformed. If you ever wondered what it would look like, what would it look like if God showed up and, and, and changed the culture? What would it look like? Well, safety would increase just like we see here. Righteousness would prevail. Justice according to God's word, will, and ways would be established. There would be a cleansing of sexual deviance like we see here. There would be repentance. There would be turning to Jesus. There would be worshiping Jesus. There, the city would bow its knee to Jesus in word, in deed, in policy, in family, in church, in individuals, in the courthouse, in the government. Every sphere, people would exalt the name of Jesus. City would be transformed. Have you ever it, it, imagine the spheres in which you find yourself in in, in the civic world, in the, in the in the civil world, and you're out there and you're going, man, I just the, the, you know the politicians are pretty corrupt, you know the government's pretty corrupt, you know the the the, the justice system is pretty corrupt. Whatever whatever you look at, and you're going, man, this needs reform and redemption. Well, who's going to reform it and redeem it, and by what standard? If God's people don't invade those spaces filled with the Spirit of God, just like Deborah, then what we are not going to see is an increase of godliness, holiness, justice, righteousness, flourishing for society. We're going to see what they saw. Corruption, deviance, perversion. Because everyone's going to do what they feel is right in their own sight. Christians, we don't do that. We do what's right according to God's word, will, and ways. That means that's your job in your home, in your family, wherever you find yourself, you don't decide what is right. God's word decides what is right. You submit to it and lead your life's families, coworkers, business accordingly. And it's pretty awesome. God used a, a timid guy, 20 years of oppression, finally steps up. Boom, transformation. They're singing about it. They're going, hey, the, 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 those on white donkeys, the rich, the, 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 the poor, like the magicians the, at the watering places, like the blue, like everyone, we should, we're, we're, they're singing and rejoicing because the entire city is experiencing the benefit of godliness. It's awesome. People are like, yeah, this is, our, we love it. See, our nation doesn't need a, a, a new president. They need revival. We need repentance. It doesn't matter who's at the helm if the, if the nation, if the people who are, who, are, who are in the civil sphere in every single space other than the presidency would bow their knee to Jesus. Guess who's also going to bow their knee to Jesus? The president. Or he'll we'll get a new one because he's not. Whoever they are. God's people, what we see is they stepped out in faith and God gave them great triumph and cultural transformation. What we see next is now that this song tells the story in a historical fashion. History is going to tell of the courageous. I want you to see songs do this. They, or songs in many ways are a historical record. They are a historical record. Like it, it's just not just stylistically, but the content. This content is speaking to a specific historical scene, correct? Right? And so this is a historical record as well as a war song and, uh, you know, scripture. It's all of these in one. And so this song tells of the courageous. And it says it this way. Verse 12, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Break out in, the, in a song. Arise, Barak. Lead away your captives, O son of Abinam. Then, then march down the remnant 
of the noble, the people of the Lord, marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their root, they marched down to the valley. Ephraim's a tribe of God's people. They marched down. Follow you, Benjamin, another tribe. You, with you and your kinsmen from uh, Machir, uh, marched down the commanders. And from Zebulun, another tribe, who, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. Verse 15, the princes of Issachar came with Deborah. And Issachar, faithful to Barak, into the valley, they rushed at his heels. What she's telling of what we read about last week, when, when Barak ro- arose and he decided to be obedient to God and his word, what happened? Thousands of men joined him willingly to go to battle. See, all it takes is one faithful man to rise up and say, hey, we're going to follow the Lord, and then God's people fall in line. It's just, it happens all the time. It's what we see happening. We, we see happening. And all of a sudden, all these willing warriors, they, they march down the battle. They're, they're willing. And it says that they were a remnant See, what God did was he, in, in this day in which there was great perversion and great apostasy and, and God's people not following his word, will, and ways, God preserved for himself a people who would worship him and who would follow him and who would obey him, a generation that, that, that is to be celebrated here, and they're being celebrated. This song records of their, their willingness to serve at the pleasure of their God. Thus forever in history, they will be known for their allegiance to the one true king. This is awesome. And I, and I, and I have to continue to contrast this because there was 20 years in which Barack, Barack was not this. Some of you have been, you feel like, man, I've been wasting my life for years, for decades. Turn in faith and repentance. March forward with God and his people. And what will be recorded historically is your repentance, your celebrate. Well, that will be celebrated, and your allegiance to your one true God and King. His name's Jesus. It says they're willing servants. Are you willing servant to follow Him? See, these tribes took active part in in, in the struggle, in the battle. They were active. They were not inactive. They were active. They rebelled against the godless Canaanite culture. God preserved for himself a people who would not bow their knee to the Canaanite gods, who, who would raise up and fight for the cause of Christ, for the, God, the cause of the Lord. In a culture that, that, they, that, that, uh, that pressed them to conform, they did not conform, they contended. They contended, they reformed, they transformed, they held the line. And this is what they're remembered for here in the song, their courage, their confidence, their faith. Furthermore, the song continues, and it now te- history will also tell of the cowards, because not all of God's people stood up to the challenge. The rest of verse fifteen says, "Among the clans of Reuben, there were they were a great searching of the heart. Why did you? S- and now, now it's indicting. Why did you sit among the sheepfold to hear the whistling of, for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of the heart. Gilead." Stayed beyond the Jordan. Dan, why did you stay with the ships? Meaning, why aren't you getting out there? Why aren't you doing something? Why are you sitting idle? The song is critiquing and rebuking those who sat idle. Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying with the landing ships. Oh, everyone's out the battle. You're just going to stay in the ships. You're not going to do anything, Asher. Zebulon is a people who, but, but Zebulon is praised. Nephtali is praised. Zebulon is a people who risked their lives to the death. Glory is what, like, this is awesome. They were, they were courageous. Nephtali too on the heights of the field. I want you to see this. This is God, speak through the Holy Spirit, speaking through his servant, Deborah, writing a song that's scripture inerrant for, and all scripture is, is for our teaching correction our rebuke for our training in righteousness and in it what he does is he god is doing he, he's contrasting the courageous and the cowards he's commending the courageous not because they were perfect but because they had faith he's he's condemning the cowards not because they weren't good people but because they lacked faith I want you to see this. this isn't about good people and bad people we're all bad people there's one good god but who who do you trust those who are commended are those not who were uh, are, are morally superior. These are just people who simply had faith in the God of the Bible, and he changed and transformed them. And the other, these other, this other group of people, the cowards, they were a part of the church. They're part of God's Old Testament church. 
And they sat on the sidelines and scoffed. See, the song singles out these reluctant, cowardice tribes of God's people. It's similar to what Psalm 1 tells us, that, 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 that there's those who sit in the seat of scoffers. See, the people sit by, they don't act, they don't commit, they don't give, they don't serve. All they do is complain. They, they, they scoff, they have excuses, they play the victim. They, there's, there's no action, there's only inaction. This is what we see with Reuben. He, he, this is the tribe that did not act. They're, we see twice, they're just, he's sitting among the sheep, whistling in the field. What are you waiting on? The people of Reuben had this, and it's twice it says this, that, that they were, uh, there was great searching in their hearts. What this is indicating is that the people of Reuben, they were moved in sentiment. They felt that. They're like, I think we should play a part of this. I really think we should go. But they never acted. See, it, it, they, they liked the idea of action. You know, if they, modern day, their, their Instagram would have had stories about, you should go out there. You should hold the line. You should hold the, you know, we're, we're, for, we're for Israel. We're for God's people. We believe in the Bible. Glory. Their Twitter would be like critiquing all those who, y'all are cowards. Y'all don't do anything. And they are doing nothing. This is why they're being indicted. If you look at Christian Twitter, you look at tr Christian Instagram, we have a bunch of Rubens sitting out there idle, wasting their life. They have a lot of words to say, but no actions to support what they are doing. They're not standing for the cause of Christ. They're just echoing things they've heard from other people. Get out, get in the game. That's what God is telling us. He's serious. He's serious. Gilead, also, this, la this tribe, they, they were inactive. Why? Because they lacked fellowship and community and camaraderie. This is what we see here. That this, then that will contribute to your inaction. If you're a Christian who's not in, in fellowship with God's people, it's likely you're going to come to a point where you just sit on the sidelines. They lacked fellowship and relationship with other believers. Inevitably, that's going to, that, that produces a, 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 a lack of enthusiasm. See, they, they never... See, Gilead is, is two tribes. It, it's Gad and uh, half of the tribe of Manasseh, which we've seen throughout the book of Judges. This is a tribe that they never actually crossed the Jordan River. They, like, they, they're actually not even with God's people. They're not even there. They're not even in fellowship with God's people. These are people like I'm an online church only people, modern day. This is what they're online church only guys. I have no, I'm not going to go to church on Sunday, but I don't really have any formative friendships. Like I'm, I'm friends with Christians, but no one's really speaking into my life. I'm not in community group. I don't have discipleship. I'm just, I'm just going through the, you know, I call myself a Christian, but I'm not, I'm not in fellowship with other believers. That's them. The tribe of Dan said, why did he, they, he, Deborah says, why did he stay with the ships? Like, it's like the guy who shows up for the football game but stays in his car. That's what it is. Like, all right, just imagine, you know, Super Bowl's coming up next week. I know there's some fans. Here we go. What if uh, whoever your team's star player is, he just sits in the, he sits in his car. He's at the game. He's at the game. He's in the parking lot. Or he's in the locker room. He doesn't come out. He has his uniform on. He's in the locker room with his uniform on. He's, he's in there in the huddle. He talks to the coach. He even gets a pre-game pre interview, but he never comes out of the locker room. What are you going to He's not in the game. You're going to be like, we're going to lose because our guy's out. Yeah. God is saying, I need all my people. I want all my people to play a part of the, this great victory. I don't need any of you, but I want you to be a part of it. Come on, Dan. Get out there. Why are you standing with the ships? The ships float. They don't do anything. They're fine. He's stagnant. This is significant because many Christians are at a point in their life where they've, they've had great success in, in following the Lord and, and being near Him. But there's a point in time that they grow stagnant and cold. There's no spiritual growth. We see actually Dan is the first tribe of, of Israel to become apostate. It's not a good look. These folks realize, they, they've never realized, that, should I say, they never realized their full potential, what God was calling them to. That he was actually not calling them for, to, to just be uh, a spokesperson or an image bearer of, of, of Christianity, to be, but, but be also be out on the field, in the game, not just by the ships. 
they lacked vision for what God had called them to, and that led them to, to, to being there right on the edge of breaking out into obedience and being scared and timid, stay by the ships. Cowardice overtook them. Asher also sat at the sea coast as well, staying by his landings, it says. Another tribe lacking vision, their leaders in this tribe uh, uh, staring at the sea, just looking out at the birds, great sunset. Inactive, timid. In contrast, we see Zebulun and Nephtali praised for their bravery. They, quote, risk their lives. Have you ever known what God wants? If you want to know what God thinks about joining his mission, this is the stuff he thinks. He wrote a whole song about it so we'd remember it and know. God wants us to be a part of his mission, do what he, uh, be a part of what he is doing. So my question for you, what are you going to be known for? And I'm not speaking of fame here. What I'm speaking is, are you going to be known for being active or inactive? We already see what happens when God's people step out in faith like Barak. Cultures change. Freedom reigns throughout a region. And the reason is, is because what we see next is that truly Jesus is the Lord of all. Jesus is the Lord of all. This might be my, my favorite uh, part of the song. Uh, verse, I, there's a few. All my favorite parts are coming. We will hear, hear, hear about them. The, the king came and they fought. The, the, then fought the kings of Canaan and of uh, Tanakh uh, by the waters of Meg Giddo. Uh, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. So God's like commanding the stars. The f- stars are fighting for God. You ever know what side the, the heavens and the earth are on? You ever know what nature, what team the nature's on? It's on God's team. Like you're like, I'm an environmentalist. Awesome. You should be on God's team or else you're on the wrong part of the environment. Like the stars fight for God. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon, that's a river, swept them away. The rivers fight for God too. The ancient torrent, the torrent, Kishon. March on my soul with might. Then loud beat, the, the, the loud beat of the horse's hoofs with galloping and galloping of his steeds. Curse, Miraz, says the angel of the Lord. Cursed is its inhabitants thoroughly because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. What we have going on here, this, this angel of the Lord here is speaking in this song. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. It's the pre-incarnate Jesus. We've said this over and over through the book of Judges, and, we, and when we preach through Genesis, anytime you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, not an angel, but the angel of the Lord, it's likely the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord over all. I want you to see he's speaking here, and, he's, and, and the song testifies that, that, the, that the stars fight for him. The rivers fight for him. The rivers and the nature obeys Jesus. The victory here is described that even the, the stars were against Sisera, the evil, wicked military leader of the Canaanite army. The stars were against him. I mean, just like, think about this. When it's not, there's one thing to say, like, if you're for me, then if you're not for me, you're against me. God says, like, if you're not for me, the stars are also against you. The grass is against you. The earth is against you. The dirt is against you. Heaven and earth are against you. The doors are against you. Your car is against you. Everything on planet earth is against you. You're like, well, I like my, I, I mean, I like sunsets. I enjoy some of these things. Yeah, so did Sisera until the stars, like, turned their back on him. And God used the natural world in part of his military victory. This is awesome. God used the, 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 the inner workings of the natural world. The forces of nature are on God's side. The Canaanite deities, so I want you to see this. This is a mockery of the Canaanite deities who, who supposedly ruled over the sun, moon, earth, and stars. It's like, the, it's like, it's like you know, going, the, um, you know, the Vikings or something. You know, like, oh, yeah, we have this, this God over here or, 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 or any, any sort of a Greco-Roman God and, and who oversees a, a portion of nature. Nope. They are powerless against the true God. No deity controls the sun, moon, earth, and stars, but Jesus Christ. In fact, everything was created by him and through him and in bows to his will. 
Next, what we see here in the same passage is this really awesome phrase, march on my soul with might. This is a very similar phrase that the psalmist will use when he says, why are you downcast, O my soul? And he tells this soul to hope in God. What we see here is this song bids the singer to preach to their own soul mid-song. March on, O my soul. March on, my soul, with might. March on. You downcast, rise up. You're weary, rise up. March on, my soul. This song is telling the soul to remember that Jesus is Lord over all. He commands the stars. He commands the waters. He rules both heaven and earth. Take confidence in him. Hope in him. March on. On, I know it's dark. I know it's hard. The season is difficult. March on, O soul. And then in verse 23, we see that the angel of the Lord, Jesus himself, now gives a strong word to those who do nothing. We've already talked about how the song critiques those who are idle, but this is, he, he then now says, curse. Meraz says the, angel of the Lord, cursed its inhabitants thoroughly. Why? Because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. See, I want you to see the the issue here is is not a failure to assist God as if he needs help. I want you to see the scriptures are clear that God doesn't need help. What this is saying is this is a rejection of God himself. He's called them to to, to go to battle. They've deliberately disobeyed what he has commanded. And I want you to see this. Some of you will hear this uh, a curse. It's a very strong rebuke. And I want you to know this. The Bible gives some of the strongest rebukes to those who do nothing. Some of you are like, well, what's the sin that they did nothing? It's called a sin of omission. If God commands you to do something and you do nothing, you've sinned against God. Not doing what God says ticks off the angel of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, here in this passage. Jesus, if you don't, you're like, well, that's the Old Testament Jesus. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you read the New Testament, how does Jesus respond to the man who hid his talent? Some of the harshest rebukes in the New Testament are by Jesus to those who do nothing. The man who hid his talent, cursed upon him as well. Additionally, Jesus, when talking about his second coming, he speaks harshly to those who are not found ready. When he comes, they have not kept oil in their lamp. He speaks harshly against them who are not found laboring for his kingdom when he comes back. They're asleep, they're idle, they're doing nothing. They're on the sidelines. Christians, we don't sit on the sidelines. We seek his kingdom first. We follow him. We advance. We move forward. We are not idle. Preach to your soul, therefore, if you find yourself idle. Preach to your soul. March on, O soul. Our God is good. Our God is in control. Jesus is Lord of all. March on. March on. Next, the song praises J.L. If you remember J.L., she's the lady who took the tent peg to the temple of uh, Sisera. She's the one who gets the victory in the battle. Well, God gets the victory, but she's praised here because Sisera was the commanding officer of the enemy forces. She's the one who takes him out. It says this, blessed, most blessed of women be J.L., the wife of Heber the Kenite and of tent-dwelling women, most blessed. He asked for water, that's, that's Sisera asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent, her hand, or she, she sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera, she crushed his head, she scattered and, and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay down. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, he fell dead. Hey, that's not a Caleb song, but it is God's song. That's a song. This is going to frustrate two different people. It's frustrated everyone in some way. To those who are loyal warriors and those who are pacifists, this is going to frustrate you. Both for different reasons, though. For one, she's a traitor. She's being praised here. I want you to see this. 
just like Barack, who had like 20 years of, of inconsistency, she was literally before this moment a traitor. She's on the other team. This is why Sisera came into her tent because they were friends with the enemy. She was friends with the oppressing tribe, the army. She was like in cahoots with them. But in a moment, in this moment, she repented and she joined God's team. And in doing so with one, one strike, with the, with the mallet and with the, with the uh, tent peg, she drove it into Sisera's head. She was a traitor and friends with the oppressors. And now she's being praised here. So those who are like loyal warriors, you're like, man, how, are, how is she getting in, in the song? She was a traitor. And then to the pacifists, don't like war, you get a little bit squirmy when you're like, the worship song sings about t- tent peg to temple. Like, yeah, that's, that's not what you're used to, right? It says that she's praised. I want you to see this. This is, this is how God views this. Blessed, most blessed, be of women. She's being praised. Now, some of you need to know this. This is not some feminist war cry like, yeah, the woman took out the man. No, that's not what it is. This is a very similar way uh, uh, of, of the language used to the mother Mary, mother, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Blessed among women. The reason why she is being praised here is because she had a repentant heart. She changed. She changed teams. How long was she on the other team? Long time. How long was she on team Jesus? One second. And that's what she's praised for. I need you to see this. Just like the thief on the cross, right before he breathes his last, switches to Team Jesus. He's going to go down in history, Team Jesus. Repentance here is what's being praised. Joining the Lord's army is what's being praised. And, and notice it, it's, it's like blesses the mother uh, uh, of JL. My hope is that, and what we're going to see next is that Cicero's mother is mocked. So this contrast here, my hope for us here as a church is that your mother would be praised because of your, your, your participation with Jesus on his mission. People look back and go, man, that's awesome. And what this text shows is that the, the mercy and grace of God is infinite. See, we look at things and we go, okay, uh, what is the majority of your life? Let's weigh it on the scales. Were you mostly good or mostly bad? Therefore, you're that type of person. God, God sees faith, repentance, and he sees redemption, clean, forgiven, do- dealt with, done because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But Cicero's mom is mocked, and this is maybe my favorite part. And this will get me into trouble, but we're, here we go. Out of the window she peered. The mother of Cicero wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princess answered. Indeed, she answers herself, have they not found, have they not found and divided the spoil? Are they taking so long because they they got so much gold? A womb or two for every man? They got to stop and have some with some chicks. Spoil of, of dyed materials for Sisera. He's got to get a new wardrobe. Spoil of dyed materials embroidered. Two-piece dyed work embroidered from the neck as spoil. This is wild. This is really wild. Uh, the Bible commends, or condemns, sorry, scoffing at God. But it oftentimes mocks those who mock God. And that's what's happening here. They are, this is a mockery against Sisera and the Canaanite culture at large. What we see, one commentator says this is a picture of Cicero's mom implying uh, this, 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 it's, it's dripping with holy sarcasm. Here she is peering anxiously through the upstairs window, squinting into the distance, demanding, uh, uh, demanding in suppression of fear for reason for Cicero's delay. Why hasn't she heard the clatter of his chariots and his horses yet? Where is her boy? And then she looks at her, her, her wise princesses to reassure her. And what do they say? Well, you know, war takes some time. Uh, they got to divide up the spoils, you know, because of the great victory likely, you know, and they're likely going to impregnate some girls. That's what it's saying here, the womb of, you know, every man gets one or two wombs. You know, that's just kind of how we Canaanites are. They're going to go uh, impregnate some girls on the way and, you know, get a new wardrobe. This is flat-out mockery. I'll help you understand it in our context, and this is what's going to get me in trouble. This biting sarcasm would be like our day, looking at our culture and going, why are they taking so long? Well, you know, Susie, 
she can't figure out her pronouns today. She doesn't know which one they are. And you know, they, them, that's a bigger group to travel with, so it's taking her a little bit longer. It's taking her a little bit longer. You know that genitalia surgery? They take longer than usual. That's why she's late, Mom. Some of you are like, that is offensive. That's how biting this type of sarcasm would have been for the Canaanites. I say that so that you get the point. That's what God is saying, mocking Sisera and Canaanite culture. See, this is like the Hebrew your mama joke. It's not okay. It, you're like, that's not okay. I'm just saying, that's, you, you're not okay with it, but the Hebrews call it a war song. They sang it at church. They called it epic. This is what, what you might be this, say, this is really offensive. Well, you know what's offensive to God? Your disobedience to him. You know what's offensive to God? Sisera's oppressing his people. You know what was offensive to God? Mocking him year after year after year after year as if he was not the Lord of all. God gets the last laugh. We are not to mock God. But God sure does mock our foolishness and folly when we rebel against him. Verse 31. I'll end with this, well, end this passage with this question. Are you an enemy or friend of the Lord? It says it this way. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. Just that, that, that's a cool verse in a song. May all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might and the land had rest for 40 years. See, the enemies of God will be destroyed. Their lives are worthy of mockery. Christians, your lives are to be dignified, not mocking God, but in love and honor and praise and worship towards him. The enemies of God will perish, but the friends of God will shine, radiate, trans transform cities by the glory of the Lord God. The question is, are you a friend or an enemy of God? And the question then, if you're like, well, how do I become a friend of God? You're like, I, I want to be a friend of God. This is where we're going to end. We're going to look at uh, uh, John chapter 15. End with this. Friends of God. This is what Jesus teaches how to become friends of God. It says, greater love has none than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends for all that I have heard from the Father I have made known to you. This is what love looks like. The love of God looks to like towards sinners, like you and me, scoffers, like what we see in the scriptures. Inactive, disobedient, wayward, apostate, rebellious people. This is what love looks like. It's made manifest in the person and work of Jesus. If you've up to this point see that there's, there's, there's these, these good guys and there's bad guys, I need you to see it clearly. There's not. We're all sinners. We're all scoffers. We all have been inactive. We've all been disobedient. We've all been wayward. We all at some point in time rebelled against the God of the Bible in word and deed and thought and action and in inaction. We all need saving. And this is what it looks like. Jesus Christ lays down his life. He traded his perfection for our imperfection. Though he was sinless, perfectly righteous, he pays the, the, the just penalty for sinners by being crucified in our place on the cross. On the cross, what Jesus, Jesus makes a way for those who were once enemies. That's the whole world to instead become God's friends. There's no greater love than this, it says. You're like, well, he's dying for his friends. Well, I need you to see this, church. We were not always friends of God. We were, re we were rebellious people against God. And Jesus Christ said, I want you in my family. He said, I'm gonna die to pay for you to be in my family with my life. Jesus wants you to be his friend. But there's only one way. He says, how do you become friends? My friends you are my friends if you do what I command. And the first act of obedience for someone to become friends with God is faith and repentance. That's the step of obedience. 
That's what it is. It's not clean your life up. It's what, what uh, Romans 1.15 will call obedience that comes from faith. Faith comes first. We put our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ who died in the place of sinners. His great love for us, we see it on display on the cross. He loves us. He wants us in his family. So we, we trust him. We give our lives to him. We give our, we give our sin to him. We, we put our faith in him. That's the first act of obedience that's required for salvation. And therefore, all obedience that would follow from that is what Romans 5, or, uh, 8, uh, 1, 5 calls obedience that comes from faith. And this is, the Je- this is the relationship Jesus has with his friends. He says that he reveals himself. He, re- he reveals the master's plan. He wants us to know what the father heart of God is, the will of God. He makes these things known to his friends. He actually has written them down and they're bound in what we call the Bible. Jesus wants you to know him as a friend. Yes, he wants you to see him as God, holy, reverent, in awe, marveling, and wonderful, powerful, commanding the the sea, commanding the river, commanding the stars. But you know what's really awesome and wonderful is that the holy of holies wants to be your friend. Marvel at that. Jesus Christ wants you to move from an enemy to a friend. See, the victory here in Judges 5 that we read of the tent peg driven into the temple of Sisera. We sing about that great tent peg and that great victory. But you know what the gospel sings? The gospel of Jesus sings and rejoices similarly in that Jesus took the tent peg not to his temple, but to his two hands and to his two feet. He got a crown of thorns that pressed through his brow. He got whipped by by the, the, the Roman soldiers. He got spit on. He got cursed. He got abused. It's the glory of the gospel. That what looked like defeat of King Jesus was proven to be the greatest military victory of all. Setting sinners free through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. See, Jesus is not dead. He is alive. Sisera is dead, but Jesus is alive. Sisera experienced what we call God's righteous judgment. Jesus received what we call substitutionary atonement, where Jesus substitutes himself in our place. Yes, for even people so wicked, like the Apostle Paul, Sisera, you, me, See, we were not always friends of God. And therefore, when we read verse 31 in in, in chapter 5, may all your enemies perish, O Lord. This can only be sung with joy and gladness, faith and confidence, if you know Jesus. If not, you're proclaiming your own perishing because of your lack of faith. Your greatest enemy, church, sin and death. They've been swallowed up in the victory of King Jesus through his resurrection. If you have faith, trust, and hope in Jesus, he is your Lord, he is your Savior. I want you to see this. He calls you friend. So we're going to celebrate that today. We're going to celebrate, commemorate, remember that, rejoice in that glory in that as we partake in communion. Pastor Alex is going to come up as you eat and drink. Be reminded of the nail-pierced hands of the Lord Jesus the path and link that he went to call you friend. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that we have been made friends of God. That Jesus, you loved us so much that you came to rescue us, to save us, adopt us, redeem us. You've stood our place for our sins. You've given us great hope through your great victory. You've swallowed up sin, Satan, death, and the grave. And I ask that we would live lives free, changed, and transformed because you were alive and you are also alive in us. May we not be cowards, but may we be courageous. May we not sit on the sidelines, but join you in the game. Yours is the victory, O God, our Lord, our King. Jesus, we praise. Amen.